First of all, good morning to everyone that have um, joined in on this webinar. Before I continue speaking, let me introduce myself. My name is Lara Potter, Marketing Manager from Strata Green. Very privileged to have you all here and to host this webinar. Uh, as well, uh, this morning, I am not alone. As you can see, we have Nathan Strom from Terracottom. He is Terracottom Brand Ambassador who also uh, going to present this morning as our guest speaker. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, understanding soils and terracotta. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Lara and Strata Green, who are our distributors in Western Australia. We also have distributors all over Australia who can locally sell you terracotta. Um, if you want to get in touch with me later on, I can point you in the right direction. A little bit about myself. I've uh, been working for Terracottom for about 23 years now. It's been in Australia, I understand, for about 25 years. And this year is our 30th year of Terracottom being made available in the marketplace. That's another story for another time, but 30 years is quite an incredible feat in business. So... Myself is, I'm a horticulturalist, arborist, greenkeeper, landscaper, the list goes on. In and out of TAFE teaching horticulture, found my position within Terracottom back in 2007, I think it was, 2006, when uh, I was approached by Terracottom to do their training workshops. Now, this was while I was still in the industry, just leaving the industry and starting into teaching. I had used Terracottom on the Olympic site for the Sydney 2000 Games. That's how I was introduced to it. And I never looked back. Uh, I have Terracottom sitting in my garage all the time. Um, it's part of my mantra or part of my process when I plant anything out in my garden or in my turf. Okay. This is me. When I'm at a party, no one wants to talk about soil health. I'm always sitting by myself. It's terrible tragedy. You have to laugh. Soil isn't a very exciting topic, but it is a very important topic because it is a medium for growing plants in. It is the water storage system like a battery of the earth that holds the water, supplies it to us, and it also filters and purifies it for us. It's a modifier for the earth's atmosphere and it's a habitat for all organisms. So remember your water cycle back in the school, it's that ever moving cycle of water moving through the soil into the atmosphere and then back through the soil and then back into the atmosphere. So the scary thing is we know more about space than we know about what's underfoot in the soil that we walk on or play with. And we only know about 1% today. The bottom left-hand picture is a plant that I pulled out a few years ago showing the polymer activity within terracottum and how plants actively search and seek out the polymers that are swelling with the water holding within them and use them at activating. Now, there's a terminology or a word that we call plant available water or PAW. That's a topic for another time. Soil under the microscope. So as you can see here, sand is very uh, rounded, smooth, porous, water goes through sand very quickly. Whereas we have clay down here under the microscope, plate-like structures, large surface areas. So therefore, the bigger the surface area, the more water is held within that soil. And we also have down in the bottom right uh, right hand corner, we have uh, loam and we all love loam. 
Loam is a good soil. So let's start with the hardest one first. This is what a lot of people can't get their head around and I will try to explain it very simply. Cation exchange capacity. It is the measurement of the fertility of our soils. So it's a useful indicator. It holds nutrient and it releases back to the plant. The reason how it does this is because of a positive and negative charge within soils and within cations and anions. So cations are positively charged ions or positively charged elements like calcium and magnesium and anions are negatively charged like clay or organic matter or humus as such. We all know what this looks like. It's a periodic table. Don't freak out. I just wanted to show you that where the cations and anions sit. So cations are positively charged. Think of cations as your positively charged friends and your anions as your negatively charged friends. And the negatively charged friends want to attract to the positive charged friends to be neutral. So as you can see here in the green, one, two, three, they are your positively charged and your three, two, one are your negatively charged. And they all want to get to this number, number two, 10, 18, 36, so on, just because that is the most stable elements on our planet. Helium, we know at number two, sits uh, as a gas that we blow up balloons with or inhale to make our voice sound like Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck. Then we've got neon at number 10, very stable gas used in lighting. Argon at 18, another stable gas used in welding. And then we've got Krypton, where Superman is very scared of at 36. And then we can go on further. Xeon, we use in headlights, so on. Why do we need to know those elements? Because of NPK. We know NPK because we use this in fertilizer and keeping our plants alive because plants need NPK as well as the micronutrients. So here's some of these cations and anions that I was explaining to you about. We wanted we want to attract the positives to the negatives, and we've got to do that in two ways or in one way. We want them to attract to each other in a stable form to get to that number or to be friends. And, and here's one of the most abundant sources of or element on our planet, H2O. We know this is water. Very safe because it's two of our hydrogen friends attracted to one of our oxygen friends to make that number. We also have this one. Both of these two are highly toxic to each other or to us, I should say. But you combine them together and you have salt. Very safe product. We consume it every day. It's out there in seawater and so on. But how does that relate to fertilizer, you're asking me? Well, here you go. One of the most common forms of fertilizer that we use in the nitrogen range of our NPK is urea. It's highly uh, percentage at 46%. So it's great for the N component of NPK. And you can see how that is just bonded in that format. So it is safe. Cations and anions. Organic matter. So we need organic matter to hold cations and anions and hold nutrient, hold fertilizer, to hold water. It's a great product, but what are we really getting? We use it to increase our cation exchange capacity and also our water capacity. But I can tell you time and time again, when I have got organic matter from various sources, it comes with a whole bunch of problems and headaches like nut grass or fungal infection. So I'm really wary of any type of 
compost or humus or organic matter because a lot of these places out there they'll swear to you oh yeah it's weed free it's seed free it's uh it's the best stuff out there or it's a premium product but buy it um duck manure or chicken manure or cow manure or mushroom compost or straw mulch or whatever whatever organic matter is out there just be wary about what you're getting and how much you're paying for it so i just want to talk a little bit about data integrity we've used 100 gram product samples of all of our amendments that i'm going to talk about because that's the lowest rate that we use in terracotta universal per square meter I've also used the most expensive price for Terracotta Universal per 100 grams. I've used the cheapest price of products per 100 grams from Google. I've used the CEC for products per 100 grams from Google. And I've used the water holding capacity for products per 100 grams from Google. So they're all out there. These are the this is the data that's available. Um, the Terracotta Universal data is available from us direct. We're not hiding it. It's available in our spec sheets. No questions asked. We're happy to show you everything that we have. There is nothing up our sleeves. So cation change capacity in organic matter. What does that look like? So in peat. It's around 100 milliequivalents per 100 grams, and milliequivalents is how we measure uh, cation exchange capacity. So these are in per 100 gram, uh, 100 gram samples. Coco koi is at 70 milliequivalents. Bentonite clay is at around 79 milliequivalents. Biochar is at 17 which surprised me because everyone talks a lot about biochar and I realized it's not that great. Compost, up around 200 milliequivalents per 100 grams. It's, it, it's an estimate. It's very hard to get any information on compost because you, you, you don't know which compost you're using. So I've just gone and got a average measurement across the, the board. So so that's our cation exchange capacity in organic matters. What does that look like versus terracotta on our scale here compared to where the ones that I just mentioned? So your biochar, your bentonite clays, your, your cocoa coir, your good quality peat and your soil humus sit around there. Our terracotta universal sits at around 180 milli equivalents. Our terracotta turf sits at 280 milli equivalents, which is massive because it's got zeolite in the product. And just our terracotta super absorbers or our polymers by themselves are up around that 400 milli equivalents. But we don't sell just terracotta super absorbers. We sell terracotta universal or arbor or turf with a whole bunch of other amendments within it so terracotta has npk it has the polymers it has a slow release and quick release npk that i just mentioned it's got a a bio stimulant or a root precursor that no other product has in the world and it has a carrier component either pyroclastic rock or, or zeolite as i mentioned so the reason why Terracotta Universal sits up there is because it contains 40% hydroabsorbent polymers and volcanic rock in the product. Terracotta Turf has, well, roughly 32% hydroabsorbent polymers and zeolites, which brings it up to there. And the arbors are at 36. I haven't got an actual... CEC of Arbor, but is pretty similar to Universal, maybe a little bit more. Here is the product on a graph, and you can see that Terracotta sits at 160 milli equivalents. It costs three dollars fifty. It's one amount to get 
to that 160 CEC and it's going to cost you $3.50. You look at organic matter, which is probably better. It sits at 40 cents. Biochar, you're going to need 995 time, uh, 9.5 times more at $15.20 per, per square meter. So this is all per square meter. Uh, 2.3 times for Coco Koya and peat at 1.6. Now, I don't like uh, recommending peat. I would rather you not use peat because it's mined and it's a non-renewable resource and we need it. So if, if you are buying peat, just be mindful. It's, it's not helping the planet doing that. So this is what terracottum can do in sand, USGA sand, terracottum turf. Nice root structure in a cool season grass. That looks like a, a, a rye grass for that picture. This is a tree planted about six months ago with terracotta. It's starting to form a great structure, great leader, nice, healthy tree. And this is me just planting using Universal. I had to get my face into a, a photo. So, on to water holding capacity. So water holding capacity is the amount of water a soil can hold before it drains away or leaches through. Most, most fertilizers that you put down, believe it or not, about 50% is leached through because the water holding capacity can only store so much of the fertilizer or the nutrient and then the rest is released. I've got numbers in sand, which will absolutely blow your socks off, but we won't talk about that. So peat roughly has around about 600 to 680 mils of water holding capacity per 100 grams. So I just use 640 as an average. Cocoa Koya is 950 mils per 100 grams. Bentonite clay is between 100 and 500. I couldn't get any exact, so I just went 250 in the middle. Biochar is 270 mils per 100 grams, and humus is 8 to 900, so I went 850. Terracotta Universal, 8 litres of water per 100 grams. Huge, huge amount of water holding capacity. Arva is 7.5 liters or 750 mils and turf is 700 mils per 100 grams and that is on our spec sheet that is independently tested and verified by our international brand of terracotta and i can get that information to you on who tested it and what they come up with we're not we don't hide any of our data we don't hide any of our numbers so costings, what's it really costing you to use those amendments in your soils? So peat is costing you 26 cents per 100 kilos if you buy it at a three kilo package. That's what I could find on Google or the internet through a supplier of peat. Coco Koya is $1.22 per cents per 100 grams in a 650 gram brick. I, that's the smallest or that I could find. A lot of people sell Coco Koya by the literage. So a 20 liter bag or a 25 liter bag. Um, hard to translate what a hundred mils of Coco Koya is per into hundred grams. I don't know the exact measurement. I know that if you wanted to get a hundred a thousand liters of water, it would weigh a metric ton. But if you wanted to get stone it's it's multiplier 1.4 to get that tonnage um, per cubic meter and uh, i think the bulk density of terracotta is about 0.8 so so for for 800 for one cubic meter of terracotta it'll weigh 800 kilos so it's just the conversion it's like that 
analogy of a, a ton of feathers or a ton of bricks, which weighs more, you know, it's, they're, they're both the same. They're both a ton. Um, you've just got a lot more feathers to make up a ton than you do of bricks. Bentonite clay, 22 cents per hundred grams at a 20 kilo package. I got that from um, a, a, a shop on Google. A lot of people buy it by the ton, but um, obviously that's, that gets a little bit, that's cheaper, but then you've got freight on top of that and packaging and it's in a um, bulk of bag and so on. But this is just the price that I could get. Biochar is $1.60 per 100 grams at the 5 to 19 kilo rate. Compost is 40 cents per 100 grams at a cubic meter rate. Compost is around about, I've found it for around about 400 kilos per cubic meter. A good compost that is. Um, you guys might be able to find it cheaper elsewhere, but I'm, I'm wanting a good compost that's weed free, seed free. It's not going to do me any harm. So, so it's around 40 cents. Terracotta at its most expensive is $3.50 per 100 grams, $3.60 for Arbor and $2.65. The more you buy of terracotta, the cheaper it gets per kilo or per 100 grams. Uh, I've seen rates down around about $22, $23 a kilo or $2.20 per 100 grams. Uh, turf, I, I've gotten down to $17 a kilo or, or $1.70 per 100 grams. But these are the most expensive prices. So what does that look like? Costings versus water holding capacity. So you're going to need 12 and a half times more peat to match TC Universal at 26 cents per 100. You're looking at $3.25 to match Universal. Not bad, $3.50 is what we're saying for Terracotta Universal. Coco Koi, you're gonna need 8.4 times the amount at $1.22 per 100. So you, it's gonna cost you $10.25. And this is per square meter, 100 grams per square meter. Bentonite clay, 32 times more to match the water holding capacity of Universal. $7.04. Biochar is going to be 30 times more at $48. And compost is around $3.76. So what does that look like on a graph or a chart? Here we are. We've got on our right-hand side, the water holding capacity of Terracotta Universal, the amount that we need, which is one unit or 100 grams, and it's gonna cost us $3.50. We move across compost to get the same amount, 3.8 times, $3.76, $48 for biochar, $7 for bentonite clay, cocoa koi is $10.25, and peat is $3.25. Could you imagine using bentonite clay to get 800 mils of water holding capacity? That would be, 3.2 kilos of bentonite clay that you would have to mix in per hundred uh, per per square meter. I don't know how you're going to do that, but it's very interesting. Where you only have to use 100 grams of terracotta per square meter. Hydraulic conductivity. It is the infiltration rate or movement of water through soil. Pretty easy to understand that. Some people like to trick you up and call it hydraulic conductivity or these science boffins, but it's just the infiltration rate. It's just how quickly water moves through soil. If you've got a, a five millimeter per hour figure on your, um, on your soil report, you would be looking at a heavy soil or a clay soil. If you have a soil report that says 150 mils an hour, well, 
you're looking at a very sandy soil. This is 150 mils per hour is USGA sand uh, soils. Hunt very quickly. Moves. You water uh, that soil and it is gone within an hour. It's crazy. It just can't hold that. So you need to add an amendment to that higher value to slow it down so that it holds more moisture. You could add organic matter, but organic matter and in any of those other products except terracotta would actually slow the, the water down, yes, hold the water, yes, but if it dries out, you've got this hydrophobic issue where you have to keep adding wetting agents to keep it uh, wet or to stop it from drying out so that it will accept water. With terracotta, terracotta does not impact the infiltration rate once in use. It keeps the soil moist. It, uh, it doesn't allow the soil to dry out. Therefore, you don't need wetting agents and you don't. it doesn't go hydrophobic. So it's saving you money there. I had a TAFE do a green for me 18 months ago and they put terracotta turf in it and the results that I got back were quite outstanding as in they didn't have to add wetting agent to this green over the last 18 months it was less susceptible to lawn grub or armyworm attack because it stayed moist uh, there was hardly any ant activity in that soil because it didn't dry out so um very i was very thrown by that data and that information that came from eddie bennett at uh tafe queensland at groverly ph so ph is the measurement of acidity or alkalinity in your soil we know that plants like to grow in this five and a half to eight range this is the ideal uh Ideal range. Now, it, there's no science to this or no, uh, this is not a mystery why plants like to live in this pH range. And it's because of this issue. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all these elements that are in fertilizer uh, you, you have a look at this number of six to seven and a half, and they are abundant in soil. Once you start getting out of those ranges, you're going to get nutrient lockout. Even though there's nutrient there in the soil and more, you just keep throwing more and more soil, more and more fertilizer to the soil, the plant can't access it because the pH isn't right. So we need to alter our pH. And the way that we can do that is if it's too, uh, to get it from acid to neutral, we add lime. To get it from alkaline to neutral, we add sulfur. Pretty simple, pretty easy. So just add those products and you're going to get your pH adjusted. And it's a very simple test. All you need is a, a pH probe. And I've got one in my hand that I'll show you shortly. Get it from either Strata Green or any of the other horticultural suppliers. So finishing up, that's my talk for those components. My next webinar will be in July, as Lara has said, and the topics that I'm going to talk about in this next one are comparing them to terracotta are NPK for plant health and terracotta. Why is terracotta good for plant health. EC or solidity. So how does terracotta help in, in saline soils and, and what you can do there? PAW I mentioned, which is plant available water and terracotta assisting with hydrophobic soils, as I did mention in that golf green at, at TAFE. Airfield porosity or AFP and how terracotta can aid against compaction and bulk density. Why is bulk density important and why and how can terracotta 
improved manufactured soils so that this is more for rooftop gardens and weights on rooftop gardens because rooftop gardens have a a load limit of sometimes around about 400 kilos per per square meter so or cubic meter whichever way the engineer wants to do it so therefore we have to put soil on the roof it has to be of light weight so that we can meet that 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 will be under that load limit that the engineers have told us. So that's it for today. Um, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask. Um, and I will stop sharing the screen and go back to my video. This is um, a probe that I've had for quite some time. Uh, get this from Strata Green or any horticultural supplier, Bunnings don't sell this. Uh, it's going to cost you in the realms of a couple hundred dollars, um, but I've had mine for going on 20 years. I got it from Russell James at AgriTurf, I'm pretty sure. And as you can see, it's got a pH reading. And when you press the button on top, it gives you the moisture reading of your soil. Anyway. Speak to Strata Green or Lara or me, email me. I can tell you the brand. It, it's come, it comes from Kell Instruments, uh, Kellway. You can um, Google that and, and we'll make that available for you. But as I said, not, it's not a cheap product, but I've had mine for 20 years and they last forever. So, yes. Um, were there any questions? That's awesome, Nathan. Thank you very much for the presentation. So I learned how superior terracotta is just with the comparison. And I think the costing side of things as well, very beneficial for many. Um, I am inviting everyone who, who's tuning in right now and want to ask question straight away, just jut it in into the Q&A um, tab just underneath. And we have one that just came in from Trev Lafree. Um, Trev asked, can you use Recordum as a top soil for turf? Yes, absolutely. We have a specialized product, as I said, that Terracotum turf product. Um, you mix in anywhere between 120 grams and 180 grams per square meter, depending on your soil type, but it's got to be in that top 150, 200 mils of your top soil. So terracotta has to be used in the root zone. When you dig it in, put it in your backfill or put it in your soil underneath your turf, not on top of, it's got to be mixed in. So you can just go to your local landscape yard, get the terracotta from us, go down there and say, can you just put this into your soil when you load up and mix it in? And then when it's delivered on site, it's already pre-mixed and then you spread it out and it, gets mixed in um, further. Yep. Thank you, Trev, once again. Um, next question is from Russell. Can't plants be pushed out of the ground with all that expansion of terracotta? Yes. So absolutely. We in terracotta world don't use the analogy of a handful or a pinch. So we want you to use a specific measurement and that's based on the hole size which is based on the volume of soil that you dig out of that hole size and it's pretty easy to understand we've got a cheat sheet versus the uh, uh size of the plant that you're using but with the amount of terracotta that you should use with the size of the hole that you should dig so in the smaller plants we tend to dig a hole double the size, which is what I've learned. I don't know what anyone else has learned, but that's normally what I use. And we treat the backfill with the amount of terracotta specified, and we put that all around the plant. Now, if it's mixed in and it's all around the plant, it can't push the plant out of the ground because terracotta will take up that air filled porosity space that I spoke about, that AFP. So it fills in those voids and um takes up that space so we specify you to use a certain amount per plant um it's a very general rule if you go more 
yeah, you can. If you just throw a handful in the bottom of the hole, well, yeah, that's not the way that terracotta is supposed to be used. So we have directions on our buckets. We have everything on our buckets for instructions. We also have specification sheets that we can hand to you on how to install it. Um, so yeah, we, we want you to install it the correct way. That's fantastic. Um, now the question from John this time, can you clarify 100 gram of terracotta can hold eight liter of water as in 125 milliliter of terracotta? Um, yes, that's the, that's, Correct. So 100 grams of terracotta can hold eight liters of water. So what I'll do, John, is I'll just share with you our specification sheet. Let me get it up. And this is available. We can email this to you. So as you can see, terracotta universal specification sheet. Here is our the product has an absorption capacity of approximately 800 of, of H2O, 8,000 milliliters of H2O per 100 grams in distilled water using that method of testing. So there is a special method of testing that we use independently. That's C and E and 14041. So, and then 95% of that water, that eight liters is made readily available back to the plant. So yes, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Nathan. Um, while we're waiting for more questions um, coming in, I will read through the poll result that we did in the beginning of the webinar, which amendments you are most familiar with. 67% um, say compost, 33% um, say cocoa coya, and then bentonite clay as well, 33%. Peat and biochar also the same, 11%, and 67% terracotta. So um, yeah, this just to show that uh, there are still a lot of questions that haven't been asked and um, you're more than welcome to submit through right now and we can answer that live. Um, another one just came through. Um, if I don't mix it well under turf, what's gonna happen? No, you're wasting your money. And the turf is gonna slip around. So you just break it in for instance, um, your rake tines are running about 25 mil or 30 mil. You're going to have issues with um, the polymer expanding underneath the turf. And when you go to walk on the turf, it's going to be slippery and so on. So I've got a, uh, got a question coming in about toxicity and to earthworm. Yeah. Yes. Um, terracotta is non-toxic. It can cross borders across the world very easily because of its uh, MSDS sheet non-toxic uh, viability. So therefore, I mean, technically you could eat the product. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can because um, it's non-toxic. Uh, so to earthworms and to microorganisms, um, it's, it's non-toxic to them. What happens is you put terracotta in the soil, the roots start to grow into the soil, creating more organic matter. And then all of a sudden you've got a really rich fertile soil and worms start to come into it and you don't have to water as often. It doesn't go hydrophobic. Uh, there's not as much pest and disease. The plants jump out of the ground. I've got photos of, of doing a, a raised garden bed at home and uh, I am not a gardener. As such, I I do it for work. I don't want to do it for a hobby. My partner loves it, so I set it up for her as a bit of a hobby. And I the just the results within a couple of weeks were crazy. Um, now that our question just came through um, yeah. from Dan, are there any climate restrictions to terracotta? This is a good question. Are there any climate restrictions? Ah, uh, no. So. Very hot. That's a difficult question to answer. But but the hotter the climate is, 
the more water you want to hold in the soil because of the heat and plants love heat. They grow very quickly in heat um, because they're warm season species. If you've got the adverse species in the south and they grow better in the cold, um, you can still use more terracotta. So as you can see, universal is being shared. So here's our spec sheet, the benefits, when to apply, just blah, blah, blah. Here is our composition and characteristics. So we do not um, falter from telling you what's in terracotta. We are 100% transparent and transparency is what I love. So if you come at me with all these questions, I'm going to come back at you at transparency. Tell me what's going on, why, how, because because if we get to the bottom of it, we're going to find an answer very quickly. Last up to eight years in the soil. So you're going to have that water holding capacity for up to eight years. The nutrient gets used pretty quickly, but you only have to go in at half nutrient rates over the life of the product. So you're going to save your fertilizer cost in. So methods of using terracotta. So 1.5 kilos per cubic meter, or I recommend in a, a, a loamy soil around about one kilo per cubic meter, which is that 100 grams per square meter rate. But you can go up to um, one and a half kilos, even two kilos per cubic meter, depending on the soil type. As you can see in, in our baskets and our growing media, that is. Um, that is manufactured, we could actually go up to five kilos per cubic meter. And, and in, a, um, uh, in a rooftop garden situation, we've done a, a job or a project just recently that's won national awards in the West End development in South Brisbane for the old Paul's Peter's ice cream factory. It's called West Village. Um, Google it. it, the results are astounding. The guys actually had to start maintenance on their uh, development six months after planting because it grew. They were expecting like a 12 month project completion, but planting was growing so quickly that they had to start maintenance six months early. Wow, that's awesome. Um... Fantastic to hear. And um, there is another question just came in as well from Karen. Hello. Um, what is the lifespan of the polymer? Another good so, one. So the lifespan of the polymer just there is eight years. So you're going to get between eight and 10. We say 10 years. We've had proof of 10 years, but but eight years is is what we, we look at. Um, but once you've got terracotta in the ground, especially for trees and gardens, um, they're growing into that terracotta and they're growing out into the um, other soil so that they can start finding water because of biomass. So what is upstairs in trees, the same biomass is downstairs in roots. So that's why we've got this drip line scenario where a lot of the feeding roots are out of the drip line. This, that's the biomass of... of um, plants versus roots. Yep. And we're still inviting um, any attendees that has uh, more questions. We still have around eight minutes to go to answer all your questions. But if you um, don't get to ask questions right now, uh, live on the webinar, don't worry, because we will obviously still have a email address that you can um, use to contact us. Nathan himself, always available through Nathan at terracodum.com.au, but also as um, Terracotta distributor in WA, uh, we are more than happy as well to uh, forward through your question or answer it um, ourselves. Our team is ready to um, assist. Uh, the email that you can use for Strata Green is info at stratagreen.com.au. Once again, info at stratagreen.com.au. And if you happen to miss the first bit of the webinar, maybe you're joining late, don't worry, we will have the recording available and will be sent through to you, um, all the participants as well as a kind reminder 
that this is only the part one of the webinar and second part will be on um, in July. Uh, for the details, date and time, uh, all of that, I will be sending it through uh, to your inbox. So you will be uh, keeping up to date. Um, we will still wait for a couple more questions. We still have seven minutes to go. Um, I, also, I also want to mention yeah. happy birthday to my daughter, who's 15, Charlotte. I just want to Charlotte, give happy birthday. Yes. She's uh, wearing her 15 Today shirt. So, yes. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> 15 yes. year old, you have a teenager. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't I know it? If there is one thing I know about Nathan, passionate about Terracotta and passionate about his family. So, <laughs> it's fantastic. Well, before I close, uh, Nathan, do you want to say anything else? Are you good to go and ready to have your lunch and celebrate good your go. daughter's good birthday? Thanks a lot yeah. for having me. Thanks for listening to me. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Nathan, for being our guest speaker this morning. And thank you for everyone else um, who already joined in and tuning in. And I hope you learned something today. And um, if you have further questions, once again, Nathan at terracotum.com.au or uh, info at stratagreen.com.au. Well, wishing you a great day and enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good lunch for those who are having lunch. And um, we'll see you on the next webinar. Thank you so much on behalf. Um, of Strata Green. Have a good Thank day. You.